Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, coming to you live from Ottawa, Ontario. I'm going to talk about canola, and that's okay, because one time I used to live out west, so it's allowed. Also, people are trying winter canola here, so there's that. Okay, so The Agronomists, this is a one-hour program. I'm going to bring my guests in here shortly. We absolutely would love your participation. Ask some great questions. Um, we're going to have some fantastic discussion about getting this canola crop off to the best start and what we need to worry about heading into the seeding season. Um, and for watching tonight's broadcast, you can, of course, qualify for uh, CEU credits and not just CCA credits. We've got a couple organizations um, that you can qualify for. So make sure you head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists tomorrow morning and get your CEUs. I feel like my screen is freezing a lot. So this is going to be a great one because, oh my goodness, I make some ridiculous faces. Um, and also, hi to Lara. Hi to Jason. I feel like I'm on romper room. My two guests are probably too young to remember what that was. Uh, so why don't we bring them in? Okay, so join me. We've got two fantastic agronomists from out in Alberta. We've got Stacey Yaramenko. Uh, she's the manager of agronomic services with Nutrien. And we've got Autumn Barnes, who's an agronomist with the Canola Council of Canada out of the left. Hello. Hi. Hey, how are we doing? Okay, Doing we're, gonna, great. we're gonna make this work. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> I, I did, as we were in the green room warming up for this, trying to figure out what we're gonna do. Um, hi to John also. Um, I'm a little bit jealous of that it's still like, you know, daylight out where you are. Anyway, um, <laughs> but today seems to be sort of like a very canola Monday. Uh, we had Warren Ward on the live earlier this afternoon to sort of sort of tee up tonight's discussion. Um, I want to start with you, Autumn. You're down in the Lethbridge area. It has been incredibly dry, incredibly windy. How is the seeding season shaping up for canola right now? Uh, well, uh, it's not the seeding season, season uh, seeding season for canola yet, so uh, so it's looking pretty good. I I think uh, my favorite quote that I've repeated for the past number of years when it's dry in the spring is that we haven't lost a crop in March before. Uh, I'm pretty sure we haven't lost a canola crop in April, except for maybe a lot really early seeder. So yeah, I mean there's still time to cross our fingers and and hope we get some moisture down here. This is um, you know we're coming off of some pretty decent moisture and good crops in the south last year, so. Uh, definitely uh, a little more optimism in my territory than there was uh, in 2019, for example, or 18 or 17, the really dry years. So. Right. So I, I will say, so where I'm at, where we've had sort of an unseasonably warm March um, as well and a pretty mild winter. And I walked one of my fields today myself that it's still pretty early and it's okay to just early that we've got some weeks for things to sort of settle in so Stacy you're up in the peace region of Alberta yeah. um, what are things looking like out your way pretty white still <laughs> I mean it is feeling yeah. like it might, be a, <laughs> it might be a slightly early spring but I mean as of right now we still have snow on the ground it was snowing in patches today so um, we're optimistic and we're getting excited to get started but we're a little ways off yet all right, so still time to plan, which is what we're sort of yeah. going to tackle this evening, right? Is that there's still time to put a plan together, all sorts of things, uh, fertility-wise, on figuring out, getting that uh, seeding rate dialed in, which is maybe one of the things I want to start with. Fertility, though, um, I, I, I think we're anticipating a very dry year for many parts of the prairies, but of course, as we said, we've got a couple weeks to go yet. Um, Stacey, maybe I'll start with you on sort of dialing in that, that fertility rate. How do you work with growers to sort of put that all together? What factors do you consider there? Sure. So, um, speaking from the piece, we had kind of a challenging year last year where there was a lot of moisture. So in some cases that meant total crop loss, um, and in other cases, just lower than desirable yields. Right. So we're not maybe totally confident in what that nutrient picture is looking like right now. So if we are able to do some spring soil sampling, or even if we have a fall soil sample from the past year, that is great. Because we probably are dealing with a few instances where we had maybe some nutrient losses due to having saturated soils for um, some time. 
and also just that we maybe weren't pulling yields like we normally would. So we might have a bit of a question mark as to what that nutrient status is sitting at right now. Yeah, for sure. So Autumn, a, a bit of a flip for where, of course, in your region where you've been traditionally dry and, and now very dry this winter. Um, if you're looking at potentially, you know, working through some of those fertility about maybe seed placed fertilizer, what are you considering there with growers? Uh oh, I think we. How did that happen? No, I think you you're oh. muted. Oh. Try see if you're muted on your own on your own end. Oh my and maybe goodness. just smash. There you go. Just smash your laptop. I swore work. I would not do that. That's but what I, I definitely do. Could. <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, we're um, frozen. Okay. So yeah, let's take let's talk uh, seed placed fertility when it's dry. Yeah. So I mean, this time of year, like I've said, like we still do have time, right? And so this is something that we kind of discuss in dry in dry springs: is should I be dialing back my my seed placed fertilizer? Um, and the reality is, I mean, take a look at your numbers, take a look at your soil, look what your seedbed utilization is. Um, and uh, if it is going to be dry growing, going into season, then yeah, it helps to be a little bit careful. Um, but when it comes back to full scale scaling back fertilizer um, based on, you know, a decreased yield expectation, it's probably a little early to be doing that. Yeah, for sure. We're not, we're not there yet. And realistically, with prices where they are right now, I would think that this would be the year that you've got some margin to push those yields if conditions favor such things, right? So uh, let's hope. Um, seed utilization, because it's one of my favorite things to talk about when it comes to fertilizer. Um, and we did have, uh, we had, was it Jeff Shano was on and he even had like a little graphic <laughs> that he had hand drawn. So that was even better. We're all about the production value here at Real Agriculture. Um, now, I do want to, I'm going to jump to one of our clips here pretty quickly uh, because it's, it's from Tail Harker. And this is one of the things I love about this show is that we go back into the archives and we pull out episodes, some of the past stuff that we've done. And some of us are definitely, you know, need to may maybe be updated. But this one is particularly interesting. And because we're going to talk seeding rates, we're going to talk seeding depth. But this discussion is very much around seeding speed and some research on on putting the hammer down or not and when seeding canola. So Jay, let's go to that clip of Neil Harker. Okay. Well, yeah, we, we've done quite a few uh, experiments on, on comparing uh, depth of seeding with the speed of seeding. And we've had them both in the same trial. And so we know uh, which one's more important. And over the years, we've, we feel that depth is, is the biggest factor. Uh, now, the, the complicating factor is, is that if you go really fast, well, then the depth can change because the back ranks of the cultivator will throw more soil. So uh, speed does influence depth in some ways, too. So, Well, I think some of the trial results you show some of the pictures, it really shows that uh, just focusing on speed, but, you know, say you, we're going to go super slow uh, and sort of foregoing the focus on depth, you're really not... There's no gain being No, that can be problematic. I mean, if you're down uh, two inches or more with canola seed, a tiny seed like that, it doesn't matter how slow you go, they're going to have a tough time getting out of the ground. Yeah. So, well, some of the focus now on precision agriculture, you know, we talk about precision planting and those kinds of things. We, we've seen some growers really focus on bringing uh, seed population or seeding population back you know, to one and a half pounds per acre, some, you know, some pretty low numbers compared to where we were at one time where we, a lot of guys were seeding closer to seven. Yeah. Do you have concerns in that area? Yeah, I have a lot of concerns with that. I think uh, there are a few factors. Uh, one of them is uh, people have been using different planters and going back to discs and where you can get a little more precise depth control and a little better seed placement sometimes. Uh, but also, in at the same time, in the, over the last two or three years, especially in 13 and 14, we had really excellent soil moisture conditions. And so they did all those studies under really excellent soil moisture. Then you come to a normal year and uh, all the great results uh, turn to dust. Yeah. 
So uh, I'm a little worried that once we come under more normal conditions that these really so low seeding rates are going to hurt us. And the reality of that though is that it's kind of the story of this year as well, right? We, I talked to Murray earlier and he was telling me about how, you know, really about this year we need to forget everything. Um, <laughs> some stuff worked that shouldn't have worked and, and that's just how it goes. But are we, are we changing our view in terms of canola stand establishment, in terms of what, how many plants we do need in, that, in a good plant stand? Or is it really the same rules apply? I think it's pretty well the same rules apply. We, we would like to see seven to ten plants and uh, a minimum of five. If we, Once we go below five, we think we're losing yield potential in this area. Now, people get strange ideas because they'll go to Australia or China or somewhere where they grow a lot of winter canola or even Europe. And uh, there they're targeting two or three plants and it works better in a winter canola situation. So then they come here and try that and it doesn't work as well. But yeah, we're, we'd like to see at least five plants and, and an optimal of seven uh, plants. And then, then we've got uh, room for flea beetle damage, we've got room for frost damage, and uh, uh, root maggot pressure is less at higher populations. So there's all kinds of reasons why you want to go there. Maturity is quicker. Uh, you get uh, through the flowering period more quickly, where you, that's where the temperature stress is. That's one of the biggest yield uh, impediments for canola is those uh, days over 30 degrees during flowering. And so if you can shorten that period up, uh, the stand is what gets you there. Yeah. It, what's really, really interesting about the whole discussion is that we're really having a hard time convincing ourselves uh, about some of these, some of these rules. Like, uh, you know, we, so we've seen for a long time that we're always trying to push growers to have a certain, establish, certain stand establishment. It seems certain pieces of the grower population no, 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 it can be way less. Why do, you yeah. think we're, why do you think that happens? Well, I don't know. People like to believe in magic, I <laughs> guess. Or, or they like to feel that they're special and they can do things differently. And indeed, some can. Some that are more careful and uh, they know their soils really well. You can push the, the limits a little bit. Uh, but some of the limits they're talking about, are they're pushing a little too far. You know, going down to one and a half pounds per acre, you know, it's not going to give you seven plants. In fact, it can't unless your seed size is well below two grams per thousand, which yeah. is about half the normal seed size. Yeah. Well, it, what's really, when you go to a field and you actually look at what five plants actually looks like, yeah, it, it's, it's pretty skinny. Yeah, it's not that much. Yeah. yeah. And so when you go less than that, not only does it look skinny and it delays maturity and you might get more green seed because you get later flowering and all that, but then you start talking about another herbicide application because the canopy is not closed. So then you're putting more selection pressure on for resistance, you're adding herbicide costs. There's just so many reasons for you, why you want a good stand and it's not all yield. It's not always yield, it's a lot of things. Uh, you, you talked about how you and Jay Wetter uh, play Smarties out in the field to show growers the, the proper amount of uh, place seeds uh, per foot. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, well, it was Jay Wetter's idea, actually, and he, he actually uh, simulated a, a square meter, and then, so we took it out to uh, a big, bigger, much bigger square than that, and we placed some, actually, they were blue M&Ms. I said smarty, they were M&Ms. And uh, so we actually placed those blue, because canola seeds often blue, on the ground to just to show them what that would look like in terms of, of what they should be seeing in the field. And what was the reaction? Well, I think they liked it, but I think they're a little shocked at uh, sometimes of how many blue seeds they needed to get the, the stand up to where they needed it. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack from that one. Also, now I want a snack. So thanks a lot, Neil. Um, quick question, um, race or comments, racist, Smarty Smelt. Jason wanted to know how long ago that video was from this, from 2016. So a little while ago. Um, and also, Autumn, your coworker, Nathaniel Ort says, for what it's worth, I've never been in a meeting where Autumn has talked on mute. So mute great job. sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Um, now, there is a question about um, spring canola in Ontario, but I want to talk about that later. For right now, I, I want to start with you, Autumn, on this one. Now, this is, you know, 26 while ago as far as, and that was, of course, when there was a big push on can we cut seeding rates back and how far back can we go? 
what's the sense out there? Have we are we getting better at that targeted plant stand? Are we still trying to pull back on rates? Where is that sort of at? Yeah, so I think we kind of uh, so so back when that video was shot, I think that was actually at the Canola Discovery Forum. Uh, maybe when we were talking about plant establishment. And uh, we were sort of looking at, um, you know, the recommendations at the time, as that Neil mentioned, was seven to 10 plants per square foot. But we were getting a lot of feedback that, you know, we're, we're able to seed at five, six, seven, eight plants per square foot and still um, still pull off a pretty decent yield. And so um, I had a few conversations with Marie Hartman and a few other folks. And, and Marie actually uh, ended up doing a meta-analysis of plant density uh, data. And it actually is supposed to be published, I think, this year. Um, but uh, so if you get a chance, then read it because I've, I've read a draft and it's great. But so really just looking at, um, you know, with our, our modern herbicide tolerant hybrids, what kind of plant densities uh, can we get by? And so um, Murray's meta-analysis and dig into the data found that five to eight plants per square foot is a really good balance uh, for our modern herbicide tolerant hybrids between economics and also your risk. So um you know, between, I think Neil said under five plants per square foot, they start seeing yield drop off. Um, in this data, when uh, recently when Murray dug into it, it was um, around three, four plants per square foot. That's when your yield predictability and your yield stability really start tanking. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we are doing better with plant establishment. Um, I'm not sure if I'm even allowed to talk. We did a grower survey uh, and, and it hasn't quite been publicized yet, but like taking a quick sneak at the data, Back in 2011, when we did the last one, 20% uh, of growers actually did plant count in their villa. And in the um, 2020 version, we're at around 50 or 55%. So, so it is it is improving. People are thinking about canola seed, I think, as more of an investment, which is really relieving because I've given a lot of, of talks and talked to people about plant establishment kind of across across the prairies quite a bit over the past number of years. And there's always, you know, this, people are upset that canola seed's so expensive, but they'll also just put it in the ground at whatever five pounds per acre, four pounds an acre, with no regard for how big their seed size is and how many plants they actually want to seed there. So I think people are starting to treat canola like a valuable resource, like it is, and trying to treat it right and get their crop off to a good start. Um, and actually, I'm going to do a quick plug uh, to a, a survey that I'm, I'm leading this year that's a, a plant establishment survey. So all of you agronomists uh, that are on the line here will be publicizing it a little more this spring, but we're doing a, a crowdsource survey. So when you're in the field, you can go out, count your plants, enter your numbers. It'll take you, you know, 30 seconds or something like that to put it in. It'll calculate your emergence for you if you want. And then that data kind of goes into uh, a database so we can make some maps and have a better understanding of what plant establishment looks like across the prairies. Um, because right now, um, you know, the, the main survey that's done on plant establishment in the prairies is, is led uh, by Ag Canada and it's the weed survey. So there's some, some density data every five years in each province, but there's nothing that's on an annual basis. So I'm really looking forward to seeing um, how our plant densities and our emergence is going to change and shift over, over years, over time compared to the weather. There's all sorts of really cool things that we can, um, that we can gain from that. Very cool. Okay. And I, I absolutely appreciate you getting the plug in there because I had almost forgotten about that. So, um, and Peter Johnson uh, wanted to hop on and say that, dang, if 50% of cereal producers would do stand counts, that would be pretty amazing. So way to go canola growers. Um, Stacey, we're in this discussion of, of course, seed size that does come in, factors in very much in, in working out your seeding rate and, and that target popul population. Where do you feel your growers are at with keeping that in mind as they dial that in? Is that is that still a hurdle? I would say it's getting better. Um, and especially with the move of a couple of suppliers to um, put more of a focus on, you know, dialing in that seeding rate based on seed size it's certainly become more of a discussion which is good to see um but of course there's always going to be a little bit of resistance to things like that um and there was always like a history of people wanting the smaller seed um because it'd get more of it in a bag right so i think attitudes are slowly changing and there is more of a focus on dialing in those plant populations a little bit better um but it's still kind of a work in progress yeah, for sure. Um, as someone who has been doing this media job for um, a long time, um, 
one of the first stories I ever did was on thousand kernel weight for to to work on cereal. Um, yeah, to work out your cereal seating rate. And I'm probably still do that story. We probably do it every year still, um, regardless of whether you're in print or what. So, hey, maybe we're getting somewhere after 15 years or something like that. Um, so now we do have some questions coming in. Jason, I'm going to hold yours until after our next clip because it's actually about um, seeding into moisture and those sorts of things. But great question here from Michael talking about plant populations. Can we increase yields by increasing plant populations, as in having more main stem pods equaling higher yields? Maybe, Stacey, I'll start with you. How does that plant factor into targeting those maximum yields? Sure. So maybe we're not looking as much at yield when we're pushing plant populations to that higher end, because a lot of the research, like Autumn was mentioning, on the lower end is to do with yield. And so we're concerned with where that yield is gonna to start to drop off. So we're not necessarily necessarily seeing a yield benefit in going to the higher range, but there are a lot of other agronomic characteristics that we can consider when we're pushing it up to that higher range. So when we have more plants, we're usually having less side branching. And so more of the yield is coming from that main stem. Um, but that also means um, it's gonna be a little bit more even, a little bit quicker to mature perhaps because those side branches do tend to take a little bit longer to mature. So up here in the piece, especially, or I guess anywhere, you know, west of Highway 2, where those fall frosts can come a little bit earlier and maybe a little bit more unpredictable, that can be valuable. So maybe it's not necessarily more bushels, but if we're getting less green seed or we're having less of those really immature green seeds blow at the back of the combine due to an early frost, then there for sure can be value at pushing those plant populations a little bit higher. Autumn, is that is that similar um, on the Canola Council side? Where do we where do we go with targeting max yield and plant populations? Yeah, I think you know the I, I think that um, that was a really great comment. Uh, there are a lot of reasons to play with the higher end of that range. Um, as far as going up and over eight, I'd have to look back at uh, at the data, but I but there was a point um, a point at which it started costing you yield, but. But I think that um, you know these these non-yield target or non-yield factors that that Neil mentioned, and then and then again here, like the maturity is huge, and especially in years where where we've got growers who aren't combining the crop and it's sitting out all winter. If you can buy some extra days or get it get it get the crop off a little bit earlier, then it's it could be worth it to you. So I really encourage growers. Like there's a reason that there's a range in in that recommendation, right? So play around with that and and see where you like to be. And if you have an issue with maturity, then you should probably be in the higher in the higher end of that. If if the cost of seed is your number one consideration, well, you might want to look at all of your, you know, all of all of your stressors. But um, but but sure, then play with the bottom end. But make sure you're actually like doing a bit of a report card for yourself, so you can say, you know, okay, well, this flowered for a really long time, or this was really late to mature. I kind of want to play with it and push my plants a little higher, or you know, maybe down in my territory where we have a longer season, um, you know, you're not so worried about some of these in-season factors that can that can take yield, then then maybe you can play with the bottom end. But it really is an individual thing. Like it's an opportunity for growers to be precise with their agronomy, right? So yeah, I think it's uh, it's an important thing. I, I always get excited talking about these things, even though they might not be the most, uh, the most exciting and they definitely, <laughs> the same conversations happen most years, so. Yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, I, I do think, and Neil touched on it as well, and that with that point of on the low end, you can't ever add more plants back, right? Like canola is elastic and will branch and will, will adapt. But at some point, if you're with that on that low end, all it would take is, you know, a particular insect or something like that to come along and you can't add plants you can only ever take away right so um say if you're on the high end you might also get a lot of moisture and then you just end up swimming in your canola when you're scouting it and yes as someone who has been in some uh very thick canola grubs um sometimes i wonder if you just surf on top too to get in there anyway um and you are always i'm always reminded that it is you know in the cabbage family when you're at that point because it squeaks um before we go to the next um and i like the smell but apparently in ontario it's a bad smell so just so you know 
Um, I, I find that weird, but there was a question about spring versus winter canola. So um, now I know obviously in Western Canada, we've had some trials on, on winter canola. It sort of comes up every once in a while on, on where we're at. So maybe Autumn, I'll go to you and then I, I can speak a little bit to the Ontario side because there is sort of a line of where winter canola is grown in spring. Um, but is there, is there really any update on, on the winter canola side? Beyond that, it doesn't work in Western Canada. Uh, not, not really. I mean, uh, the last plots I saw in Lethbridge were were a number of years ago now, and and they couldn't get it to, to establish. But actually, I was I was just um, on a webinar uh, in the U.S. and there was a, a, a winter canola breeder from Kansas State University, Michael Stam, and he was talking about how there's some kind of promising new genetics, but I, but still promising new genetics for like the northern U.S. Not so much yes. for. So yeah, I, I would not be holding my breath for winter canola varieties for right. the berries right now. Yeah, or where Stacy is. Although she's got moisture. Yeah. So I mean, that <laughs> might work. So yeah, I will say uh, so west of Ottawa. Um, and there are, I was just talking to Jen Dolman. I, I just sent her a quick text. She's up near Renfrew. She does grow spring canola here in Ontario. Um, but there definitely seems to be a line about uh, Prince Edward County kind of in Ontario where sort of south of that, uh, west of that, you're going to see winter canola with pretty good success. Um, here we, we do certainly struggle with sweet midge. At, uh, at an inopportune time uh, for those spring crops. So it's definitely possible, but I think it really depends on your area. So, um, but there is actually work at a AFC Harrow, I think near Guelph that works on winter canola. So we'll maybe get some info on that. So, um, but switching gears, I wanna go to our next clip, which Autumn, you may recognize the woman in this clip. Um, and this is, uh, this is going to sort of tee up our next discussion, which Jason already sort of hopped onto here, um, where we're going to talk about uh, seeding and moisture and depth, and if we chase moisture. So here we go. Clip number two. Yeah, so I'd say the, the number one question that we, we puzzle over every time it's, it's dry in the south, which for the past few years has been more often than not, um, is whether or not to chase moisture. And I'd say that one really, really depends. I mean, right now it's April 25th. I know a lot of growers are already getting into their canola or getting through their canola. Um, and when it comes down to it, you know, if you're, if you have to chase moisture down to an inch and a half or two inches, you're really putting a lot of pressure on those little seedlings. They've got a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of ground to cover, I guess, to come up out of the ground and actually emerge. So, so pushing depth is something that you really want to do with caution. Uh, when you set your drill to an inch and a half, are all of the seeds coming out in an inch and a half? Um, or are you going to have some issues with some of them going two inches or further? So really, I would I would caution growers um, about uh, about chasing moisture. On the other hand, you know, if it's getting into mid-May and our soils are really warm, we're down here in southern Alberta, our soils are pretty warm. I mean, if we get a shot of moisture, um, maybe maybe it is okay to push to an inch and a quarter or maybe a little bit more. But again, you really want to make sure you're actually hitting that depth and not going further because that that is a common thing when we chase moisture is to end up a little deeper. Um, placement in general, I think, has been a little bit tricky for growers this year, especially if you're in some... Um, some heavier soils or some harder pack if it's super super dry i know there's been issues with um you know opers or cedars just not going into the ground quite properly um so so that's that's a consideration as well and i'd say you know as we're seeding in these dry conditions we really want to make sure that we're checking placement uh frequently to make sure that the seed is going where where you want and that you're getting good seed and, and fertilizer separation so um, in regards to, to fertilizer, that's another one where, where um, you know, in dry years, we get a lot of questions about if growers should be backing off on fertilizer. And um, I guess the, the good thing, if we can say that about the past three dry years, depending on where you've been in southern Alberta, is that um, if you didn't really get much of a crop off last year, uh, your fertilizer is probably still sitting there. So I know there was a lot of spring soil testing going on um, to see just how much was was left over in the soil. So, so certainly we could be seeding into conditions this spring that we've got adequate uh, adequate fertilizer in the soil. And and um, regardless, I think we really want to be careful about our seed placed foss. So no more than 20 pounds um, of of foss, uh, especially you know when it's been so dry down here. And and another thing which uh, I think 
I know in seeding it's really busy, but something I'd like to see growers do a little bit more is to turn off their foss, um, you know, for 100 feet or 150 feet and, and mark that spot or make a mental note of where it is, someplace you'll be able to come back and find it and go and compare emergence between that spot where you turned off your seed place foss or your seed place fertilizer, uh, if you've got a blend in there, and then compare it to the rest of the field and see if you are having any uh, negative emergence impacts from your seed place fertilizer. Because I think that is... You know, we're, we're averaging around 50% emergence across the prairies for commercial canola. Um, and, and I think that seed place fertilizer probably is responsible for some of that loss. So, Anything else we need to know? Yeah, so, so another question is, um, when should I seed? Um, and I think that growers are down here are certainly taking heed of just seeding regardless and not waiting for moisture. And I think that that's something that we really need to... Uh, to consider. It's it's May 20, or gosh, it's April 25th right now. A lot of growers in southern Alberta are going on canola or starting on canola. Um, but for the rest of the prairies, you know, if, if you're dry, waiting for moisture is probably not the best thing to do. And once it starts raining, I mean, we can always cross our fingers that it just is going to rain for a while. And it's better to have that seed in the ground um, and, and wait for moisture than, than to try and wait until the ground is moist and then try and get in and seed and potentially cause some issues later on as well. In the past, uh, in the past couple of weeks, it's been pretty windy in southern Alberta and, and across in Saskatchewan as well. Um, and so that, that does quite a bit for drying out soil and I know we've had some discussions internally about you know if you can wait for it to not be a windy day to seed. I think that's a bit of a tricky order especially in my territory in southern Alberta where it seems like it's just been windy for a long time. Um, but, uh, but certainly we've been seeing a lot more, a lot more drying out and, um, and uh, if there is something you can do I guess to, to change your seeding practice or to try and get a bit better placement um, you could always uh, you could always try and play with packing pressure a little bit if that's something that you can adjust with some ease. Um, maybe maybe use a little bit more packing pressure on your lighter soils to try and um, you know utilize that moisture in the soil better. Um, but again, this is something we just kind of have to have to manage and really just cross our fingers and hope for rain. The more things change, the more they stay the same. It's windy in Lethbridge. And, uh, um, I don't even know what you, I don't even know what year that was from, but it's sort of, I, I feel like it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so this sort of sets up uh, this discussion. So Jason has a question here. Um, it, he's out of Manitoba. It is also incredibly dry there. And he's saying he doesn't want to put canola down two inches, but if that's what the moisture is. And so his our current hybrids are sort of more vigorous are they better at handling a stress like being planted deep than say older hybrids is that question Who wants to take me? it first yes there stacy what do you think what do we what do we get in our new genetics you know i'm not sure like in general i suppose we're selecting for more vigorous hybrids but i'm not sure if that's a parameter that's tested for and maybe autumn can speak to that a little bit better but i think it's also important to keep in mind that it's not just you know the seedling physically pushing through the soil that's the problem it's you know all the soil pathogens and other mayhem that can happen to that seedling while it's on its way up so yeah part of it isn't having enough energy to actually physically push through but there's also other risks that come into play with the deeper seeding depths yeah, I think that's that's absolutely correct. And and while like the modern hybrids are are slightly more vigorous, I still get nervous at two inches. Like that's um, that's really pushing it. And like if you look at um, you know issues with with root rot, especially like up in Stacey's territory where we have more rhizoctonia, um, you know we generally see those issues when the when when the hypocotyl is quite long under the ground. And so um, there's there's some real risks uh, aside from just, you know, hitting that moisture. And, you know, I like when I think that that video was last year um, and the year before, like there were there were a number of fields where you had to go down two inches to even be at moisture, never mind in it. So I think the number one thing that growers and, and the agronomists out there need to be doing is actually going out and physically checking every field because it's easy to look at a map and say it's dry. Um, but if you don't have a Dutch auger, go buy one and go dig down and find the moisture, you know, go to your customer's fields, figure out where it is, how deep it is, and start thinking about, you know, how accurately you can get to depth, because 
you know, if you are going to be putting the seed at two inches um, and that's your target, how much is it of it is going deeper? And also, you know, like the benefit of it being closer to the soil surface, especially if you really have to go down two inches, is that a light rain is going to actually reach that seed at three quarters of an inch or an inch, whereas mm -hmm. if it's you know, an inch and three quarters down and you get a light rain, it's still stranded down there, not really doing much. Um, I've also seen issues where, um, you know, things compound. So it was a dry year. We had group two carryover. We also had, you know, this one field I was in was seeded too deep. Uh, it also had root rot. You know, it was just this one thing on top of another. I mean, how much stress do we want to put these poor little seeds through, right? Like they're tiny, just give them yeah. a little break. Um, but I also understand why you'd want to. So I think play around with it. If you really want to to seed two inches and you're confident, then I mean, that's that's your decision and, and see how it works. But for me, I, I get a little nervous uh, uh, seeding too deep, uh, especially even in dry. Yeah, well, and, and you know, you, you make the point now and on the video editing of your actual seating unit is that, you know, realistically, there is variability in that depth. And especially if you're not checking it and making adjustments, but or if field conditions are variable or whatever the case may be, you might be targeting an inch and a half, but some of it might end up at the inch and three quarter or whatever the case may be. So realistically, if you're targeting two, you might be sticking some. Um, now there's an interesting discussion happening uh, in the chat. And yes, I agree, Jason, also mentioning herbicide carryover for sure. But there's a discussion going on about intercropping. Um, and I think Jason has pretty much answered it. It's it's what you would add in if you're going to put in uh, peas and canola and what your seeding rate may be. And you're familiar with peas and canola being piola. But the, the one comment was also about faba beans, to which now I have to figure out what is the name for a canola faba bean intercrop. Is it fabaola or is it faba? I don't know. So we have to decide this. That's our job for this evening. Um, anyway, <laughs> but, so you're welcome, Autumn. This is this is what you get when you agree to this. And Stacy and Stacy and I have never met before, so she may never come on the show again because this is this is what we have to put up. Um, now, uh, now it is interesting though because of course you're both in Alberta, but in and for anyone watching the states or anything like that, um, Alberta is a very large province from north. To, you guys are basically almost at the two extremes of it of where we farm, so it's pretty great. Um, and also, you you basically have um, completely opposite um, conditions right now. So so interesting to sort of get that as well. Um, I want to bring this to you in talking about, uh, you know, in, in the face of seeding depth and seeding conditions and all those sorts of things, when do you go by the calendar and when do you go by conditions? Because seeding depth, obviously, seeding to moisture, these sorts of things, all of that matters. But what about in a tough year where we're not getting in the field? How much does the calendar matter? I mean, it matters because we have we do have a fairly short season up here, right? But we can't go by only the calendar and ignore the conditions. And I feel like we're pretty well adapted to that up here because no year is different and we kind of work with the, the cards we're dealt. Um, so, I mean, yeah, certainly pressure gets higher the later and later it gets into the season. But it's always important to keep in mind um, that we're getting that crop off to the best start. Um, and we're building that yield potential in a constructive way. And we're not sort of limiting that potential by going in when conditions aren't quite where they need to be yet. Um, so there is no consensus yet in the chat over FAB. I don't, anyway, um, now, but Peter does have a question or a comment. A question, his comment is canola won't grow in the bag. So leaving it in the bag, if it's super dry or whatever. Okay, fine. But in talking about seeding to moisture, does a warm soil make a difference on how quickly that comes up out of the ground? So if we're talking about going into a soil or warm dry soil, will that make a significant impact? Do you think on the stress of that seedling? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if it's a if it's cold and it's dry and it's deep seeded, then you're going to have more headaches theoretically than if it were warm and dry and deep seeded. I mean, what that's one less stress taken away. I don't know if I've read research on that exact subject, so I'll just go out on a limb and and say it seems that's like a logical 
conclusion. Um, so, I mean, right now our, our soils are, are warming up um, and we haven't had snow in Southern Alberta in a while. Like it's, it's looking pretty bare out there. So I actually need to get out in the field and go check some, some soil temps, but like we're guys are seeding other crops down here. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's, uh, mo moisture temperature, like all of those things really do have an impact. And, um, as far as, uh, going by calendar date, like in Southern Alberta, we've had years where guys are pushing in, in April, um, where the soils are warm enough. Um, we still have to worry about frost every once in a while. So yeah, I mean, there's the soil temperature, but then there's also, you know, the calendar date and the risk of fall frost or spring frost. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we haven't even, so we haven't even talked about flea beetles yet. Do we want to, or do we, should we save that for another day? I just, I do feel, especially last year, but it, it just seems to me year over year that the, the flea beetle pressure is just, so incredible and i certainly know several farmers that have had to spray or spray multiple times um or reseed per se so stacy are, are flea beetles just a big an issue up your way as they are in many other parts of the prairies they can be um and i mean it varies a little bit from year to year um but anecdotally i also find it it varies a lot from field to field. So definitely, I think things like crop rotation and past history of insecticide use. So if somebody's had to spray for flea beetles in the past, we often tend to see that that field is going to be a little bit more of a problem for insects going forward. So, it, you know, it's all a system, right? And if we can look back a couple of years, often we can kind of come to a conclusion about maybe why we are seeing higher flea beetle pressure in some fields than others. So um, yeah, I guess to sum it up, um, we do have flea beetle problems from time to time. Um, and sometimes there's, you know, not much you can do about it if it's just a particularly bad year for flea beetles. But yeah, something to be managed holistically, I guess. Autumn, how about where you're at? Do you yeah, get I think... your feeding method? Sorry, what's that? Once they start feeding, that's it. You're done. Yeah, and you you just know, walk away. I don't, I don't think it's quite that bad. I I don't know. I I've been in in a number of fields where I've been told that I'm walking into a wreck, and as soon as I get out of the headlands, it's fine. Um, so uh, my I guess my my number one um issue with flea beetles is just I think the lack of time taken with scouting. Um, often people walk into an entrance or they walk into a headlands and they say, "Oh my gosh, my flea beetle! You know, like my crop is gone." And it's early in the season and they're worried about what it's going to look like for the rest of the year and they freak out and they pull the trigger and buy it and spray it and uh that's not really uh stewardship that we uh that we want to be promoting or or doing so um you know i think going out there checking getting out of the headlands is just so important with any kind of scouting but especially with flea beetles especially with anything when you're thinking about spraying a foliar insecticide you cannot just walk into the headlands and make a decision um I, uh, whenever I'm in the fields in the springtime, I always have a hoop with me. And I find with flea beetles, especially, um, it's really easy to walk to a really bad spot or to a really good spot. I, maybe that's just the way I'm, maybe I'm the only one, but I, I really will get drawn into a really good spot or a really bad spot. And I really don't want to make my decisions based on, you know, where my eye drew me. So I try and, and throw a hoop and get a bit of randomness in my flea beetle assessment. And, you know, when you're when you're getting to 25% damage, um, that is time to pull the, the trigger, you know, because we know we move from 25 to 50 really fast. Um, but there's been a lot of fields that are 10, 15, um, you know, even 20% or, or more, or it's just in the headlands. So I think proper scouting is huge. And actually, um, we just got some infographics done this winter um, that are really awesome that show the, the percent of leaf, leaf area loss. And I think a lot of people, you know, especially if you've got uh, uh, summer students or inexperienced scouts out there, like make sure they're really comfortable with what 25% leaf area loss looks like. Because, uh, you know, when you're worried about the crop, it's very easy to pull the trigger when you don't need to or spray the whole field when you only need to spray, you know, the outside rounds. So it's one of those ones. I, I love those graphics because 25% damage is actually a lot. The difference between 10% and 25, it's like, it is a lot. And 10%, so 
like 10 percent sort of looks really bad but realistically like that's still not you're still not there so it, it's sort of i mean i suppose it's a testament to how hardy the plant can be even though it's that tiny and it can actually take 10 to 15 percent damage and and be okay uh, i think we do probably tend to underestimate or sorry, overestimate the amount of damage, right? And and pull that trigger too soon for sure. And great point about the headlands or or just certain areas of the field, because of course these are they move in to the fields, right? So they don't emerge out of the ground in the middle of the field. They're coming from the headlands or from from another field or something like that. So so really important uh, for sure. Uh, there's definitely <laughs> oh yes. Um, Jason adds that he hates flea beetles, as do I. Always look at the non-damaged leaf area versus damage because your eyes will always go to the damaged first, like Autumn said. And Autumn, I will definitely say if you, you would agree, but I think all of us are either very attracted to the best parts or totally attracted to the worst parts of the field. I think it's just human nature. Good. I think we all do it. And yeah, and so the hula hoop, I think, is that is just one of those, it's a perfect sort of way to, to get that bias out, right? You just chuck it and go check and away you go. Um, so, which is pretty fantastic. I can't believe we are like running out of time here. So I do want to uh, check out our last clip. It tells me it's like 12 minutes long, but I really hope it's not. Um, but it, it does touch on uh, evaluating your stance. So this one here is with Ian Epp, and, and we have touched on some of this. We've touched on some of these things. I want to I want to watch this, talk about that. And then I do want to very quickly cover a bit of the herbicide carryover concerns, because I do think that's definitely should be in the back of mind uh, for many farmers on the prairies this year. So Jay, let's go to that clip of uh, Ian Epp on plant stand evaluations. Yeah, so seeding rates is always a hot topic. Seed, seed costs represent a significant part of costs, uh, input costs in growing canola. That being said, having a, the right amount of seeds in the ground is the most essential thing you can do. It's hard to compensate for a lack of pl canola plants that really can limit your yield potential. So getting the right amount of plants in the ground in the right area is key to having a successful canola crop. So we do have lots of questions on, can I change my seeding rate? I want to lower my seeding rate or I bought a different drill, how does that affect my seeding rate? Um, different conditions, we seed into wet conditions, we seed into dry conditions, uh, insects, the amount of risk, these all, all factor into having an, uh, establishing a competitive canola crop, which is what we need to have that nice yield target we have in mind for fall. So the first thing, the easiest thing we can do before we change our recommendations is finding out in, in our fields, on our farm, what is our yield rate? Or what is our plants? How many plants do we have per square foot? Do we have eight plants, seven plants? We can target different ones. And our seeding rate changes, we can have big seeds, small seeds. So once we've allowed for that, we, we uh, figure out how, how, what size our seed was, so our thousand seed weight. We figure out um, how many plants per square foot, so our seeding rate from that. And then we throw the hoop and we find out how many plants we actually have in the field. So in Western Canada, we average 50 to 60% emergence. So for every two plants we're, we're put, or seeds we're putting in the ground, we're getting one plant out of that. So some fields are better, some drills might be better, some conditions are better. But the key thing on your individual farm is knowing what your emergence is to start with. Once we know that on average you're getting 50% on your farm, we can adjust seeding rates accordingly. It might be the easiest thing that we can maybe lower your seeding rate a little bit. But if you have poor emergence and you don't have enough plants, the best thing you might be able to do for your farm and for your yield potential is maybe actually upping your seeding rate to have a competitive stand. Is this a good time to evaluate a drill and also try to figure out whether or not it's uh, you're getting good separation from the fertilizer because fertilizer can damage seedlings as well? Yeah, absolutely. We've had a reasonably dry spring right around seeding time, so fertilizer burn can be an issue. Now is a great time. We're having emergence, so do we have even emergence? Are we happy with the amount of plants where, that are emerging? Now is a great time to look. You can count your plants as far as making future recommendations all the way up to harvest. Even in the after swathing counting stubble is good. But as far as making decisions for this year, now is a great time. Our canola crop here is one to two leaf. That's a nice time. The plants are easy to see. They've pretty much all emerged. We can start counting and seeing what our emergence actually was. So I've thrown my hoop and now you're gonna count the plants in the hoop to get an idea of how many plants per square foot we actually have here. So the key thing, um, it doesn't have to be a fancy hoop. You have to know how big your hoop is. My hoop happens to be a quarter of a meter squared. Um, so you throw your hoop. We're going to count all the plants in, in our hoop here. Um, keeping in mind, we're not going to be counting plants that are in between the rows that are likely volunteers. So we're trying to disclude if there are volunteer canola, we're going to try to not count them in our count. 
So we count how many plants we are here. I always throw my hoop. I try to throw it at least a few feet away from me so I don't get biased to picking a, a spot with no pl less plants or more plants. So trying to get a really random sample of what this field has in it. So in this hoop, I have 25 plants per square foot. Uh, if I do my math, um, I'm ending up with about eight plants per square foot here. So eight plants per square foot, this is a really good sample. This is probably a few more plants that I'm expecting to see on average, but again, in order to get a good idea of what you have in your entire field, you want to throw your hoop quite a few times. Some, hoop, some spots are going to have a few more plants, some are having a few less, and hopefully you average out and then you can figure out what your average uh, plants per square foot is across the field. I don't know if you guys saw Ray's comment about seeing the dog grab the hoop, but uh, we'll put that on the list for uh, this summer's canola school and uh, we'll see what we can do. We're already filming some, um, so I'll, I'll let her know that we would like more pets and more tricks. So there you go. Okay, so Stacey, I wanna, I wanna start with you. He summarizes quite a few things that we, we went over, but he does make the point about farmers sometimes, uh, you know, being surprised by what their actual emergence and plant accounts are. But what, what is that like in your area? Is that something that farmers definitely, when they go out and do the work and do, they're sometimes surprised by that number, by that emergence number? Yeah, I would agree. And I would argue that maybe it's not something that happens enough. Like maybe we aren't doing that often enough, getting a, a grip on what the actual germination is and then maybe doing stubble counts later to get a handle on what we're putting in the ground versus what we're actually harvesting. So, and I mean, in the context of reducing seeding rates, I think I consider that to be like an advanced practice. So if we're going to start looking at some of those really low end seeding rates, then I think we should also be definitely doing things like um, germination counts, double counts to get a handle on what your seedling mortality is with your set of conditions, your land and your machinery. So, I mean, it, anyone could benefit from it, but especially if you're going to start looking at lower seeding rates. Yeah. And Autumn, what, um, like, do farmers think, do you think sort of overestimate as far as how, how good of a job that the drill maybe is doing as far as emergence. So what that mortality is like, what are all those factors that line up for your final mortality? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think there's a history of overestimating, but I think over the past few years, um, this has gotten so much more attention. Um, so I think people are really starting to think practically about it. Um, and also there's been some, some advances in technology. So, um, so people are getting better emergence, I think, but, but still, if you've never calculated your emergence, you should start at 50 to 60% when you're calculating a seeding rate. Um, prove yourself otherwise, you know, and, and until you do, that's where you should be starting. And generally, um, you know, if you're gonna invest a whole pile of money in a, in a premium piece of equipment, then you are going to figure out that math, right? But, uh, but it is really important to go out and, and check because uh, it's very easy to talk about how expensive canola seed is, and it's less easy to make sure that every seed comes out of the ground and turns into a plant that you then harvest. Absolutely. And uh, certainly in the comments, there was plenty of discussion about planters versus seeders. Um, and, and I think this is one of those ones, the reasons to go to a planter, if you're also going to be planting corn, soy, that sort of stuff, they do great jobs on canola, but realistically, you probably can also potentially dial in with your existing equipment to maybe do um on the mortality side as well too right so uh before you make that leap but there's also other reasons for a planter um it looks cool and the neighbors like it so that's a big one um okay i want to as we as we run out of time here we got a couple more minutes but um on um, very quickly i do want to touch on the risk of herbicide carryover so um, this is one of those ones that maybe is is pretty common in the pulse world, uh, but certainly canola can fall victim to herbicide carryover as well. Autumn, because you're in a dry region, uh, what conversations are are you having with growers right now? Uh, well, we learned some hard lessons a few years ago about a few chemistries that growers had been, you know, that wasn't exactly a recommended practice. Um, you know, product uh, one product in particular being applied to pulses uh, that wasn't totally on label. Um, and, and we saw a lot of wrecks in seven, 2017 and 2018. So I would say really get to know your labels. And I actually had an agronomist uh, texting me tonight about, um, about some concerns with uh, a product that might carry over. So 
really know your chemistry, especially uh, if you're putting people in after a pulse. Um, be, be very careful because uh, especially on a dry year, we are going to see issues and it is really heartbreaking and awful to watch it. And sometimes even, you know, you'll have really dry conditions. The crop will be struggling. There'll be, there'll be carryover damage and you get a rain and all that does is kind of flush the herbicide a little bit further into the roots. And then it just kicks it back even more. And, yeah. and that's not really, you know, it's hard for a crop to recover from that. So yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, get to know your chemistries and be prepared to get out and scout. Uh, if you're, yeah, hope, hopefully people are not going to be taking risks in that in that sphere uh, this year because uh, I've seen enough of it in my territory in the past few years. For sure, and and this is one of those ones. Um, sort of every discussion that I have, uh, you know, it it's the moisture in season the year before that really drives a lot of this chemical breakdown right so if it was dry the year before and maybe dry the year before that it's not winter necessarily moisture that makes a difference it's in season and and just like you said autumn you get a rain and it activates that pushes it into the root zone and away you go so um really awful to see and definitely something to keep in mind for sure um we've actually got um i'm not sure how i say aspalin valley farms i hope i'm saying that right um they've been doing their plant stand counts with drone and high res footage. So yeah, so heading out there and doing their counts that way. Now I don't know I actually, how you get a drone drone to throw a hula hoop, but maybe that plays into that whole dog discussion that we could just, you know. Um, but that's pretty cool. Have you ever done it? Uh, Stacey, do you, do you use drones out to do any of your scouting or is that still just for, yeah. you know, farmers? Yeah, I mean, I play with the drone, but I've never used it for that application. So that's pretty interesting. And I think yeah. we're still kind of yeah. learning all the things we can do with the drone. Yeah, for sure. Um, mostly, I like to watch um, the videos of when they're crashing into water and people are running to catch them. And then they catch them just as they fall into the water. That's the best use of a drone. I'm just kidding. They're very <laughs> useful. Um, and I really do like all the great harvest videos and things that people do, but, um, I, I love that application. That's a fantastic application for it, right? To find either weedy patches or stand counts or all those sorts of things. That's, I mean, you gotta ground truth it, right? For sure. But like, that's a fantastic way to see your whole field. So, um, Yes, that is that is super cool. Okay, um, yeah, we're running out of time, but this has been super fun, Autumn. I did want to, especially because you you do have your plug for your survey. How uh, would an agronomist get a hold of you? I know you're going to be promoting it more, but uh, for anybody watching uh, this, how would they get a hold of you if they want to participate? Uh, well, you can just go to canolacalculator.ca. Um, the survey is called Canola Counts. You could Google Canola Counts or uh, feel free to give me a, a text or an email. Um, I'm, I'm on Twitter, sort of. Uh, <laughs> not a lot. But uh, yeah, the survey is called Canola Counts and, and you'll definitely be hearing about it. But feel free to, to reach out to me by, a, by phone or, or text or email if you have any other questions. Okay. Stacey, you're going to fill it out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, could, I could throw some you know, bogus numbers in there and you can try and figure out which ones I put in there. Um, I'm just kidding. I would never do such a thing. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, and, well, and one last question actually for you, Stacey, in, um, in planning for, for fertility for the year, how important is it not just like how many years do you go back when you're when you're creating that fertility plan? I mean, obviously you use soil tests to sort of, you know, keep your numbers current, but do you just go back one year, two years? How many years does that that look like when you're working with growers? Um, like basically, I'll take as much information as I can get. So if they do have records going back, then all the better. Um, and I guess historical records are even more important for nutrients like phosphorus that take kind of a long time to cycle in the soil. And that history is a little bit more impactful than say something like nitrogen, which is a little bit more, you know, um, it reacts a little bit quicker than something like phosphorus. So if we have that historical information for some of those nutrients like phosphorus, that is super helpful. Um, if we can match, you know, soil tests um, up to crop removal and fertilizer application rates, we can get a sense for if we're adding back more than we're removing historically. And that's super important. So that soil test is kind of like a snapshot, but if we can enrich that with that historical information, that's perfect. Absolutely. All right. Um, 
this has been so much it has been wonderful to meet you stacy so thank you so much for agreeing to do this and thank yeah, you autumn thank you. it is wonderful to see you again um maybe one day we'll see each other in person again wouldn't that be amazing human right. interaction is such a treat right <laughs> yeah, it is a treat. I, I really hope that we uh, don't take it for granted ever again. Um, but yes, now, oh, Lara. Okay, we're talking about Lara was uh, on your point, Stacy, talking about the type of sulfur fertilizer, uh, of course, and of course, canola being a big sulfur uh, user, that's super important. Um, but yes, yeah, so that is that is the agronomist for tonight. So thank you to Autumn and to Stacy for joining me uh, this evening. And um, everyone, if you would like to get your CCA credits, be sure to check out realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow morning. Um, you get over there and enter in your info. You can also sign up for the agronomist e-newsletter that will just send you a reminder of when the show is going live, what topic's going to be, uh, just so you don't forget, and uh, all that sort of good stuff. And uh, next week, this is, we're actually like trying desperately to plan in advance. Um, and next week, we're going to talk about insects. So Tracy Bowdy is going to be uh, joining me uh, here from Ontario. We're definitely going to be talking about some uh, BT resistance stuff happening. Uh, Western guests yet but we're working on that but please uh uh i think it'll be me hosting so please join me next week 8 p.m eastern six um and thanks everyone in the comments fantastic discussions love to see everybody solving some uh problems for each other and sharing uh, your experiences and i think i'm going with fabiola i'll be honest all right thanks so much for joining us thanks for getting real and getting connected with the agronomists Bye, everybody.